Um, not everyone knows what the SVS is. We will get to that. I guess if I was going to have a, a subtitle for this talk, if I could get my clicker to work. There we go. It would be start securely without upsetting people. Hopefully that's a little bit more straightforward. Um, but yeah, but first of all, thanks very much to NDC for bringing me over. Really excited. It's my first time at NDC. Having a really great time. Um, really great, great conversations with people. It's been good fun. Um, and this is a topic that I'm passionate about, and you'll see why in a sec. And I think it's really important. So I'll try and keep it structured. I'll try and keep it actionable. But uh, let's start off with a story. So I work in my day job as an application security consultant. And a few years back, I got brought into a, a big company. We'll call, them, uh, we'll call them Lumber, Lumber PLC. This company is a big software company, and they wanted to start building software securely. And I got brought in quite late on to help them with this, because by the time I got there, they'd already built this giant software, um, secure software development lifecycle policy. It was like 50 pages. It had all sorts of activities, all sorts of tasks, loads and loads and loads of writing. And they're like, yeah, you're, you're going to implement this now. Like, OK, let's, let's you know, see what I can do. Let's, I'll, I'll try and help. And their plan, which was a little ambitious, let's say, they were going to take the, the, the big bang approach. This was an organization that had an application security team, and they'd got this giant policy, and they thought, OK, we're going to go into this product team, this development team, and we're going to spend, I don't know, two, three months with them, implement everything, and then we'll move on. And they'll be secure, and then can move on to the next team, and then so on, and so on, and so on. So I was a little skeptical of this idea and, and said so. They, they persisted, they persisted, so we, we pressed on. We decided, OK, let's see, let's see what we can do. So they had tasks of all different types, stages of the development process from the beginning up to the end. And I started asking, OK, well, what does the policy say for the requirement stage, for the design stage? Uh, and they said, aha, yes, we've, we've thought of that. We have got the checklist. Now, I hadn't seen the checklist yet, but I started asking a few of the people in the different teams, OK, what is this? What is this checklist? What is this uh, list of security requirements. And they're like, oh, it's, uh, yeah, we, we know about that. And they'd sort of get a little bit worried and sort of shuffle away. Um, I sort of asked various people. I got similar reactions. They seemed a little bit scared to talk about it. I started asking, OK, well, are, are these things that you're doing, are you following these requirements in the checklist? Have you been through it? Are you like updating on an ongoing basis when, you, you know, when your product develops? And, I wasn't getting any answers. And eventually, I was like, what, what, why is everyone so scared of this thing? Why, why is everyone so upset? Because it was monstrous. It was terrible. It was enormous. I was scared looking at it. I'm not surprised they were. Again, application security is my thing. But this was huge. And someone had decided they were going to be able to use this. You know, every development cycle, every time they need to think about a new feature, they were going to be able to use this to somehow build software securely. We know that we want to encourage developers to think have, you know, have security in mind to build software in a secure way. But we can't just dump a load of stuff on them, a huge quantity of paperwork, a huge quantity of requirements, and expect they're going to be very happy and just swim with it. We need to think about you know, how can we do this in a manageable way, and how can we do this so it's sustainable and ongoing. So I want to sort of group today into four main problems and sort of talk about those four problems. Um, information requirement overload, having too much information, putting too much information, too many e expectations on developers, and how we can customize to try and avoid that. Security is always this sort of outside force. It sort of comes in from outside and says, OK, these are all the special things you need to do, um, and you must do because it's security. So how can we contextualize security? How can we say, look, we're going to think about security in the wider context of the organization? You know, how, does the, how is this important to the, the organization? The third problem is if everything is important, nothing is important. We can't just say, this is really important, this is urgent, this is on file. You, know, you need to be thinking about all these things at once. We want to be able to um, prioritize our efforts. We want to be able to say, OK, this is where we want to start our focus, and then move on to there. We can't just be on fire about everything all the time. And then finally, one of the biggest problems that I've seen is that you get a point in time solution. OK, this works today. We've managed to put this process in, and we were able to do it today. But what about tomorrow? What about going forward? How can we try and make sure this carries on being a sustainable process? 
And that's where the word operationalize comes in. The idea being we want to build it into our operations. We want to build it into our processes. We need to have a way of doing this going forward. So before I dive in, um, a few words about me. Um, you can read that later. You can look it up later. I don't want to read through it all myself. Um, like I say, the key things to know, um, I'm very much sort of deep in the weeds of application security. That is my day job. I work as a consultant. I work with a lot of different organizations. I see a lot of different environments. I see a lot of different development teams, um, which means I hope that I get appreciation of sort of different challenges organizations have. We're going to talk about the ASVS in a second. I'm one of the co-leaders of the OWASP ASVS project, which means I also know a fair amount about that project and have been quite embedded in that as well. So uh, try to take these different experiences, these different um, pieces of knowledge that I've picked up and pull them together into some sort of practical picture of, you know, what can we do here? How can we use this? So I'm going to talk briefly about what the OWASP ASVS is. I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, and then I want to compare it to other OWASP projects as well. And then we'll go into these sort of four problems and we'll dig into them a little bit more and say, well, what, you know, what are we going to do about them? How are, we, how are we going to approach these issues? So what is the ASVS? I've already heard someone ask. Um, you tell me. Let's start off with a quick quiz just to wake everyone up. Who here has heard of OWASP? OK, most of the hands. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Wait for it. Who has heard of the ASVS before coming to this talk? Not bad. It's about half. That's a good start. OK. Who's used the ASVS? Who's actually sort of got down and started playing with it? Who knows what section V2 of the ASVS is called without looking it up? No cheating. Don't want to see anyone looking on phones. Anyone? Anyone? Authentication? I didn't see who said that, but well done. Authentication? And finally, who can tell me by heart what requirement 4.0.3252 says? Anyone? Anyone? So I had to look it up as well. Um, it is a requirement about um, password, about uh, secret questions and password hints and how you probably shouldn't be using them. But OK, so a lot of people heard of the ASVS. Uh, a few have used it. That's a good start. So you've got a basic idea of what we're talking about here. Um, but I want to put a bit of context in first. Like when I talk about what is the ASVS, I like to talk about what is not the ASVS. What isn't the ASVS? What, uh, and related to some things we may know more about. So I think we've probably all heard of the OWASP Top 10 Risks Project. If you've heard of OWASP, we've probably heard of the OWASP Top 10. Um, this is a great project for you know, introduction to application security. It's released every few years. It's got a really, really strong team of leaders who've got a lot of experience in the area, who come together and sift through the data that they've gathered from various organizations and come up with you know, the, the major problems in application security today. Um, it's very frequent, you know, it's the most well known, it's very frequently cited, it's free cited as a standard, but it's, it's not a standard, it's an awareness document. And that's all the point I've made at the bottom here. It is an awareness document, it is about building awareness of application security. To try and you know, make people understand this problem a little bit more. So we shouldn't be referencing as a standard. We shouldn't be saying you should be OWASP top 10 compliant. That's not how this is supposed to work. The project leaders are very clear about this. This is not a controversial opinion. Um, it's not a comprehensive list. It's bringing a bunch of problems, not necessarily all the problems. Each item in the OWASP top 10 isn't necessarily one problem. It may be many problems sort of wrapped up into one nice item. Um, and because it's bringing problems, it's sort of a little bit difficult. I find it difficult to say to the developers, OK, here's what you need to do. You need to go and solve this problem. I'd, I'd rather come to developers with solutions. So another project I want to talk about is the OWASP top 10 proactive controls. This is another top 10 project, a lot less well known. But it's instead of bringing a bunch of problems, it's bringing a bunch of solutions. The idea is, you know, here are key things that you can do in order to build your software more securely. Um, you can look this up. I've put them here, but uh, okay, I'm not going to go into these in detail. I'm just trying to give some background. So it's a great starting point. So I think if you want to get someone started in actually building software securely, it's a great document to read through. It's a great resource to get a basic idea of what you, know, what, what you need to think about. What are the considerations you need to have in, in mind? It's got a great team, team of leaders, also very experienced. But again, it is, it's a top 10. It's not comprehensive. It's not designed to be a standard. It's designed more for awareness, for an introductory level. Um, and it's not really organized in a way that you can really match yourself against it. It's, it's a quite sort of narrative document that you can read through, which is nice. But again, if you want to say, well, how am I doing? How's my application doing? Um, what do I need to do in this particular area? It's, it's a little bit less easy to work with. 
So the top 10s aren't doing the job. What are we going to do? Um, and as you might have guessed, my answer would be the, the OWASP ASVS. So what is the OWASP? <laughs> All right. So the ASVS is a set of requirements for a secure application. The idea is we want to define, OK, here are a relatively long list of requirements saying you know, these are the things you need to make sure are in place if you want to build an application securely. And it's designed to be a standard, which means it's quite long. It's quite detailed. Um, but we've tried to keep it quite um, readable in a way. And you know, each item, there are a lot of items, but each item should be relatively self-contained. You can read an item and think, OK, this is how I'm going to act action this particular item. It's designed to be what we call leading practices, which means that when we're putting it together, we try and think about all what's going to be relevant today, what's going to be relevant in the future as well, um, to try and make sure that if we're going to have this for a few years, it's going to stay relevant and it's not going to become obsolete and there aren't newer things that are coming out that we've ignored because they're not sort of final 1.0 um, functionality yet. It's very um, widely reviewed. It's developed out in the open in GitHub. Anyone can come along, um, open an issue, ask questions, submit feedback, submit suggestions. Um, so, you know, there are four, five project leaders, but you know, hundreds of different people have provided their feedback, provided their ideas, provided their suggestions through GitHub. Um, I'd very much welcome you know, anyone here as well if you're using it and you've got questions to, to go, go there and, and ask as well. You know, it's very much designed to be this open standard. And the final thing I want to say is it's written into three levels. The idea is you start off with the first level, which is sort of the minimum level, which is a certain set number of requirements. And that's, as a starting point, OK, where do we start? We start with a minimum level. We then have level two, which is a standard level, where we'd like all applications that have sensitive data in to get to. And again, getting to level two is a, another set of requirements on top. It's quite a lot. But you know, slowly, slowly, we'd like sens applications with sensitive data to get there. And finally, level three, which is designed for the most sensitive applications, high value transactions, medical data. Um, which adds some extra requirements, but some you know, more difficult requirements. Um, and here's a quick example of what it looks like. The idea being that we have you know, each requirement set out. It needs to be relatively self-contained. We have an indicator saying what level it is. We match to common weakness enumeration, which is a, uh, a project, I think, from MITRE, which um, you know, maps out different security weaknesses that can exist. And again, the idea is to keep it quite sort of punchy, quite easy to map against, quite easy to say, look, this is the item we're thinking about, this is the item that we're worried about. But it's huge. We we're talking about 280 of these requirements, each one of these. And like I said, what we're going to talk about now is how can we try and approach that. If you want to know more information about the ASVS, I'm not going to dig into the actual project itself much more now. I want to focus on actually using it. Um, I've given talks about the project itself in the past. You can see one of those talks there. Um, but yeah, that is a high-level summary of uh, what the ASPS is. So the question is, how can we actually use this? How can we build this into our requirements process? So I want to go back to our R4 problems, and we'll attack each of these in turn. So our first problem is information overload. And to do that, we need to try and customize. We need to try and say, OK, well, let's focus on the areas that are most interesting to us at this point in time. If we're thinking about a development process. We're usually thinking about a particular feature. We're usually thinking about a particular enhancement. We're usually thinking about a particular subset of development at any one point in time. We don't want to look at all you know, 280 requirements for every single feature. This brings us back to Lumber and their checklist. They tried to bring um, the whole checklist every single time. Have you been through the checklist? Have you updated the whole checklist? And the developer was like, no, I don't want to look at that thing, let alone update that thing. We want to focus on, OK, what's important in this case? So for the ASVS, the first thing I'd say is you can take a copy of the ASVS. You can fork the ASVS and start building out something that works well for you. You, know, you don't need to read through all this. This is just an extract from the document which says you can do this. It's expected that you're going to do this. The ASVS is deliberately designed to be generic for everyone. Not every requirement is going to suit every organization. Um, but there are a few do's and don'ts here, a few things that I'd say you want to avoid, and a few things I'd recommend that you do. The first thing is you know, match it to your situation. Say, look, what, what's relevant here for us? Are we using Graph, GraphQL in our application? Are we using this anywhere in our organization? If not, then you can just put those requirements away. You don't need to talk about those requirements. There's no point in going to developers and saying, oh, oh no, they've got to select 
not applicable, not applicable. You don't, we want, don't want to be in that situation. If you make changes that you think are going to be useful for the upstream project, send them back. Yeah. We'll go back to the GitHub repository, make the suggestions, let everyone else benefit from those. But make sure that when you're dropping requirements for your particular situation, you justify why. You write documentation that says, look, this requirement is not relevant to us because we don't use the technology. This requirement is not relevant to us because it's handled by an external um, provider or something. For example, we don't need to worry about how we store passwords because all of our password storage is handled by this one authentication mechanism we don't have to worry about. On the other hand, you definitely don't want to make changes without saying why. You don't want to forget that. You don't want to miss that off. You don't want to be in a situation where you know, a year down the line, someone starts asking, why aren't we doing this? And no one, no one thought to write that down. I'd also say don't. You know, if you're going to drop something, make sure it's definitely not relevant right now. And it's not just a, a prioritization. I wouldn't use this as a prioritization thing at this stage. Don't just say, OK, well, we don't want to worry about this now, so we'll drop it off what everyone's looking at. We'll come back to it in the future, because that will become the final state. Everyone will say, well, that's been dropped, so we're never going to look at it again. And try and avoid changing the numbering. Eventually, you might actually want to map back to the original standard. If you've removed requirements, changed numbering, moved things around, you probably, you know, it's going to be more difficult to map that back. It's going to be more difficult to use this universally. In other talks, I've talked about how more organizations now are thinking about using the ASPS for verification, for someone, you know, a security reviewer to come in and say, well, how are you? Um, complying with this requirement of the SPS. If you've got the, that numbering in place, you can immediately say, well, we know how we do this because you know, this is our internal version, it's got that number, and this is what we do within our organization. So yeah, figure out you know, what's relevant to you, figure it out up front, have that as a, a centralized process, and then you don't have your developers, your end users, your architects, whoever is you want to think about security and requirements process having to do this themselves every time. Again, you don't want to be in a situation where you've got to go through a long list saying not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. So how can we do this? So again, we want to think about what's relevant for the feature that we're thinking about, the area of the application we're thinking about. Now, I talked about levels. And you could think, well, maybe we want to start with level one because they should be slightly more straightforward and it's more the basic level. It's an option. It's not ideal. I think, again, you get run the risk that we're going to do something but not come back to it later on. Um, the ASVS is split into chapters. We talked about you know, chapter V2 being authentication, chapter V3 being session management, chapter 4 being access control. You could try and say, well, which chapters are relevant specifically to this feature? It may not be an exact one-to-one -one mapping, though. What I recommend is spending a little bit more time on it and thinking, well, can we find a way of saying which requirements are going to be relevant in which situation? This is what I've done for um, one of our clients. We basically said, look, let's, let's think of some questions we can ask about a feature. Let's think about how we can characterize this particular feature. You know, does this feature change the way that we do authorization or require new authorization settings? Does this feature do cryptographic operations that, you know, apart from, say, TLS, which maybe is relatively straightforward, maybe it starts doing encryption and decryption of data? Does it accept untrusted input or you know, input that could end up somewhere bad and we don't need to keep track of it? And based on the answers to these questions, we can build up a picture of what's going to be relevant in this case. You know, there are a whole bunch of requirements in ASVS related to encryption, encryption keys, and encryption rotation. If this feature doesn't involve encryption, we don't want to see that. We don't want any end users to have to go through that. We don't want the developers to look at it. Similarly, if it's straightforward, it's just pulling out a report, we're not taking in any untrusted data, any untrusted input, we don't need to start worrying about where's that data going, where's it being rendered, where's it coming from. You know, we need to worry about what we're rendering to begin with. But again, there are a whole set of requirements we don't need to think about for this particular part of the feature. So here's an example that I uh, use with this client. So the idea is, a whole set of uh, questions here. And again, this is spe specific to this client. So it's difficult to do this in a gener generic way, which is why it's not part of the SPS itself. You know, for example, this client was using Auth0 for their authentication mechanism. So that meant there are a whole bunch of requirements that they didn't really have to think about because Auth0 would handle that. Um, so that meant that there were certain things they had to think about. They had to make sure that they were configuring that securely. So they did still have some considerations there. It wasn't completely out of mind. But there would be no point in trying to have a, a generic thing that tried to you know, generically say, well, does your feature do this? 
we want to make it specific to the organization or make it specific to their situation. You know, there are already a lot of questions here. We want to try and cut that down as much as possible. So here we have a couple of, um, of questions selected. We've got business logic and uh, we're modifying how OTPs are generated. It's a slightly strange combination, but uh, there we are. That's what we, an example we came up with. Then we can see that it then gives us, okay, what are the SPS requirements you want to think about in this particular situation? These particular characteristics of the feature and where the other characteristics aren't relevant, we're just going to focus on these requirements. And these are just examples. And again, if we then pull out another couple of questions and say, well, actually, this feature also involves external files. It also um, adds functionality related to authorization. Then we get some additional requirements as well. So look, security is always going to be a relatively big area. We're always going to want to try and, and focus. But this way, at least we can say we're not looking at 200 things. We're looking at 10. We're looking at 15 to begin with. The idea being we want to focus on what's most important for this particular feature, or more actually what's relevant for this feature. You know, at this stage, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's just not relevant. We don't need to talk about it at the moment. It's not going to be a part of this feature. So for this problem, we want to customize. We want to take a copy of the ASVS, and we'll see how we can do other things with this copy of the ASVS that we're using. We want to tailor it to the organization. We want to get rid of things that are just not going to be relevant at all. And then we want to think about oh, how can we cut it down even more? How can we allow the end users in an easy way to focus on what security issues are most um, relevant to what they're doing at this point in time? I'll have a, a summary sl slide at the end of each section. I'll have a summary slide of the summary slides as well. So don't worry about taking too many photos. I'll put the slides up at some point as well. OK, so security is this outside force. This is you know, Lumber PLC decided, OK, we're going to parachute in our security team. We're going to sit with the product team for a few months, and then we're going to disappear off again, and everything will be magically amazing. Um, and there's, there's, I think this comes from a particular mindset. When you think about how security fits into the organization, and something that I think, again, I'm maybe preaching to the choir here. I think people may in the room may appreciate this, but certainly maybe the more hardcore parts of the security community, maybe it's less well appreciated. Um, security is not special. <laughs> security are not special snowflakes. There's no like magical thing here. There's no, um, you know, this isn't some sort of super team that come in and you know, everyone's going to worship. And I think. It's a bit of a security mindset sometimes that people think, oh, yes, we're a security team, we're here to help. Like, you know, this is a, a special thing that we have to come and help you with, and therefore you're going to respect us more because it's so exciting. Um, now, if you're not careful about this and you take this the wrong way, this could make your lives a lot more difficult. I'll explain why in a second. But I think it's the sort of direction we want to go in. Um, if we think about software, we think about what's what are the quality attributes of software? You know, how do we know, okay, this software is okay to use? If you talk about quality attributes, you look up on Wikipedia, it will give you a gigantic page like this of all sorts of things that, are, that make up, okay, what is, a, what is a quality piece of software? What is an acceptable piece of software? If we go to an ISO standard, we can cut that down a little bit. It talks about you know, things like performance. The software responds in a sensible amount of time. Um, usability, you know, people can understand how to use this, piece, this application. And obviously, it also talks about security. Security is just another characteristic of the quality of the application. You know, in the same way, when you're building a piece of software, you're going to ask, hey, well, does this feature perform acceptably? When a user clicks on the link, does it take 20 seconds for something to happen, or is it happening really fast? No one's going to put out a piece of software that takes 20 seconds every time you click a link, because the users are going to give up after two seconds. Can the users understand how to use it? Is it intuitive? Can they follow through the flow of the application and feel like, yeah, it's, it's comfortable, I can, I can work with this? Or are they constantly trying to search in the help functionality? Is the user interface really inconsistent? They're struggling to use it. They're constantly baffled. They're constantly unhappy. Again, no, one, no one's going to release a piece of software and say, yeah, we've done great work. This is really good. We're going we're gonna to release this to the, to the public if no one can understand it. So that should be the case for security. You know, if this is not a secure feature, this application is going to put the user data at risk, put other users' data at risk, then in the same way that we wouldn't put out software that doesn't perform, software that no one can understand, we shouldn't be putting out software that's insecure either. We should be thinking about security as, OK, well, this is just another, another part of the 
application. This is another part of the considerations we have to take. But it's not going to be the same for every organization. You know, security isn't seen the same way in every organization, doesn't apply the same way in every organization. Um, each organization needs to think, well, what is concerning for that organization? And that's where the context comes in. Because when you think, OK, well, what does security mean in this organization? And then we come to the word threat modeling, which is a bit of a buzzword, I know, but I'm going to try and keep it simple. Um, but I think it's important as a part of this context. Because we're going to say, well, OK, what's threat modeling? I, this is a slight unconventional definition, but I did get it approved by a, a threat modeling activist who uh, also happens to be my boss. And he's like, yeah, this is, this is OK. So if we think about threat modeling, we are intentionally considering, as in we're doing this as a specific activity, what can go wrong? You know, okay, what's going to make us sad? What's going to make our business sad? Um, in an, in your specific case, in, you know, in specific case of this business, what's going to make our business have problems? What's going to put our business at risk? Because the idea is we want to think about, well, you know, we want to demonstrate how security fits in. We want to demonstrate that security is part of the quality of the software. We want to demonstrate, okay, this is something we need to consider. But how are we going to do this? We want to show, OK, well, this is what's going to make the business sad. We can't just say, well, this is a security risk because it's a security risk. We want to say, this is a security risk because it's going to stop our business making money. It's going to wreck our business's reputation. It's going to hit one of our you know, critical revenue-generating services. Now, if you're lucky, someone within the organization has already done this, and has already pulled this together, and you can, you can lean on that. You know, if the organization already has some sort of risk register, threat model that says, you know, these are the things that are most concerning. Maybe the security team's already done that. Maybe the risk team's already done that. But maybe that's already done for you. You don't have to do it yourselves. Um, but it's an important perspective to have because it's then going to guide the subsequent steps. Because now we're saying, okay, well, what's, what's going to make us sad? If we lose our customer data, we're going to have a massive hit in reputation. You know, I worked with an organization who were collecting huge amount of personal data. I'm trying to decide how much to say about this. Let's say personal data about people. They were marketing to you know, end users. They weren't marketing to businesses. And they had a breach. And suddenly, they were all over the news for having a breach. And people were like, well, if I'm putting all my personal data into this uh, site. Am I going to want to carry on using them? If they're, you're going to have this sort of security breach. And there's a lot of sensitive data there. So you know, this wasn't Facebook. This was a small organization. You know, Facebook lose millions of people's worth of data. Everyone's like, oh, that's a shame. And they carry on using Facebook. This is an organization that was a lot smaller and had major competitors. And yeah, you know, all their users could have just walked, gone somewhere else, and they'd be completely wrecked. Oh, no, I want to carry on here for a second. If our site is down for half an hour, it's gonna, we're going to lose endless revenue. We're going to lose more revenue than we can actually afford. If we're e-commerce and it's the week before Christmas, and you know, we're trying to do our biggest business of the year, and our site goes down, maybe that's our biggest risk. Maybe at that point in time, maybe at all. We're going to lose all this revenue, and suddenly we can't afford to keep going. Um, if we're very reliant on the integrity of the data in our, applica our application, maybe I don't know we're doing some sort of currency exchange, and we want to make sure that people can't change the rates, so that people start making in incorrect change trades. You know, then how if someone can change data in our application? That's going to be a massive risk for us. So we have to think well, in our organization, in your organization, what's the most concerning thing? What is going to make the business sad? And that's the context you have to put it in. So we want to make sure that security isn't seen as a special snowflake. It's not seen as parachuting in, doing all this uh, um, training and work and saying, here's what you should be doing. Now go and do it and bye bye. And we also want to make sure we understand you know, what does security mean for our organization? What's important to our organization? What is going to make our organization sad if it goes wrong? Because these are the, this is the information. This is the, you know, these are the categories that we're going to use in the next steps as well for other problems, such as prioritization. If everything's important, nothing is important. We need to start saying, well, OK, maybe these are all the things that could be relevant. And in the first section, we said, these are the relevant items. These are the items that we want to focus on for this particular feature. But now we need to say, well, in what order? Where do we want to start? Yeah, we might still have 20, 30 requirements. Well, what is the most important? What is less important? And I said earlier that you know, the idea that security isn't special can make your life more difficult because it becomes a double-edged sword. It becomes, on the one hand, you're you know, part of the application, part of the, of the application quality, part of the requirements process, just like performance and usability. But now you have to justify 
your existence. Now you have to say, well, okay, well, this is why we have to do this. This is why it is important. We can't just say it's important because security. We have to say, you know, this is important because there is a business risk here. And that's where we have the threat model to help us. So now we've said, well, confidentiality is really important to us. If we lose our user data, then you know, our business is going to be irreparably damaged. So that means if we've got a new feature for allowing someone to view a user's profile, and we're thinking, well, what's going to be important to us in this case? What's going to be the highest priority? And we know that we can't lose user data because it'll, it'll destroy our reputation, destroy our business. And we know that, say, a requirement like this one, this is at the bottom one, it's hard to see, so I've moved it up a bit, um, about accessing other people's records through uh, it's often called IDOR, indirect object ref indirect insecure direct object reference. Um, the idea that a user can see another user's records just by browsing to it, you know, that's going to be important to us. We're going to make sure we're not allowing that to happen, that we've got protections in place so this doesn't happen, because this is a critical risk for this particular feature for our particular business. And again, we've got availability is a big issue. If we know that we can't allow our site to go down, and maybe we're creating a upload photos or upload media function. Then maybe this requirement around not allowing large files that are going to cause a denial of service if they fill up a, a drive somewhere or if processing these files takes up all of the server's processing power and suddenly it's not serving other users. We're thinking in each feature, what is what could go wrong in this feature? And how does that map back to what's going to make us most unhappy? And again, for integrity, maybe, like I said, we're a currency platform. We've got a currency ticker going along our platform that's saying these are the current exchange rates. You know, if you get uh, this many dollars, this many euros, this many Bitcoin, this many euros, depending on what sort of exchange we are. Um, if we're building that sort of functionality and we know that we have this you know, integrity problem, then we're going to want to make sure that our end users can only do exactly what we want them to do. We don't want them to have a wide variety of privileges. We don't want to um, be in a situation where we're having to say, well, they can do all of this stuff, but let's you know, take off the editing function at the end. We want to say, look, for this functionality that the user can view, and that is it. No one else is going to start editing through this functionality. We're going to find a requirement. I'm going to say, look, this requirement is most relevant for us in this case, because we don't want any risk of a user starting to edit this data, because it's going to completely wreck our business. That's one side to prioritization. Um, the other side is looking at trade-off. How can we say, OK, well, do we want to do this requirement, or do we want to do that requirement? So a few things to consider here. Difficulty versus criticality. How difficult is this requirement to implement, and how critical is this requirement? If we see this as a, a highly critical requirement, and it's easy to implement, then we're going to run for it, obviously. If it's uh, very difficult to implement. It's not going to bring us much value. It's not super serious. It's not super important. We're not going to do it. But it becomes more difficult when it's not that simple. When something is quite critical, but it's also a little bit difficult to implement, we need to start thinking, well, you know, how easy is this going to be? How much time is this going to add to the overall development process? So my advice here would be to try and balance between things that are easy to do, that bring value, but also keep in mind and prioritize things that are harder as well. Try and have a few of them together. You don't want to just do harder things because it'll take a lot of time, add a lot of time to development, and just generally be demoralizing. But at the same time, we can't just focus on the quick wins. You can't just focus on the things that don't take much development time that are easy because we're going to end up ignoring the longer term, more difficult things that may be higher impact, but it's going to be really hard to get by into them later on. And that brings us to a related point about perfect versus good. You know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, security nihilism around that says, oh, well, this, this control doesn't work in this very specific case, so it's not a good control. You know, if they, they can bypass in this particular way. Um, you know, WAFs are a perfect example. You know, web app, WAF, web application firewall, certainly not perfect, certainly bypassable, but it's a good control. It's going to slow people down. It's going to slow attackers down. So we're not saying well, we're not going to use a WAF because it's not perfect. But, you know, unless you've got other good reasons not to use it, that's not a reason not to use it. We don't want to let the perfect become the enemy of good. We don't want to say, well, this control is not perfect, so we're not going to do anything. You know, an imperfect control is still better than no control. If we start off by saying, look, we're going to implement this mechanism, which is a little bit easier, it's not 100%, and then 
further down the line, we'll improve it, we'll um, increase the control that we have. And again, we're making progress, we're getting some security in, we've also got a, uh, a roadmap of, okay, here's how we're going to improve it, and we're taking it in a gradual way, so we're not trying to drop it all on at once. And again, it gives us the idea of quick wins, it gives us the idea we are making some progress. And the final thing in trade-offs is really, really sort of team-dependent and situation-dependent, but it's something that I've seen and I think it's important to think about. Often, when you think about you know, choosing our battles, how much security stress have developers had in the recent time? You know, if they've just had a whole bunch of, I don't know, security tool results they've had to go through and they're really sort of unhappy about security, then just trying to drop a whole load more stuff on them. You know, straight afterwards, you're just going to make them more demoralized, more unhappy, and they're less likely to do it effectively. You want to think about you know, what are the big things we need to focus on today? What are the big things that are worrying us? Choose which ones we want to focus on and think about which ones we can, can delay and push back so that we're not you know, we're putting as little onto the developers at a particular point in time. It's going to be very subjective, but certainly you know, in my experience, developers can get very... Um, let's say, unhappy about security and very sort of demoralized and very much, oh my gosh, you know, not the security person again. We don't, we don't want to be in that situation. You want them to be you know, happy to see you, happy to ask you questions. You don't want to be in a situation where they're hiding under their desk every time you walk through the theoretical office that you know they're sitting with everyone's working fine. But <laughs> bear in mind that if you push things later, it'll be harder to get buy-in. You know, there's been a lot of chatter recently about, you know, is it more expensive to fix things, to add new mechanisms later on the process after a feature has already been deployed. Um, there was a study by IBM about fixing bugs right after deployment that apparently has been debunked or wasn't based on any real data. But the fact is that it's going to be a lot easier to get something done when the developer's working on it there and then than to go back in six months and say, well, can you go back to this thing and add this additional feature, this additional security control? So you have to be careful about what we push back. We don't want to just push back everything because our oh, developers had a bad day. Let's skip security and we'll push it into the next release because it's going to be a lot harder to get by at that stage. Um, so it needs to be a blend. Trying to get some stuff done now, pushing some stuff off, managing expectations that we're pushing this off, but we're not pushing it off forever. We're going to need to come back to this. We're going to need to look at this three months, six months down the line, but at least we're spreading it out. We're not saying this is all has to be done now and this is blocking the release until we can do it. Something that can help with that is a security backlog. We talk about you know, the development backlog as a you know, relatively normal thing in software development, the idea of having a backlog of the features that we want to work on, the features that we're going to work on in the future. So here we have the security backlog of, well, these are the security items we haven't done right now, we want to add them on in the future. The only thing here is we might want to be a little bit more specific about how we time these things or how we prioritize these things. Usually in a security backlog, there'll be some sort of prioritization, Things that are priority four may never get dealt with. Things that are priority one might get dealt with faster. Here we might want to be a little bit more specific about, OK, this needs to get done in the next release. This needs to get done in six months. Because we don't want things just to be on, fall into the backlog and get forgotten about. And that, then, that then means monitoring them afterwards, saying, well, we're going to keep an eye on our backlog. How long have these things been in the backlog? Have they breached what the objective was for fixing them? And that way we can make sure that, again, we can get some stuff done now, we're going to push some stuff off till later, but it's not going to disappear. It's not going to fall off of our radar. So prioritizing. We want to say, what's, you know, what's the worst case in our situation, and use that to prioritize. We want to think about the trade-offs. How do we balance between quick wins and more impactful fixes? How do we manage the team's security fatigue? And finally, how do we track things that we've delayed to make sure that they don't fall out of mind? The idea being that we can say we've trimmed down to what's relevant for our case. We've now focused on what's the highest priority in our particular case. And we now have a much better picture of how we can implement security for this feature now and looking forward as well. So we've got a sort of point in time process. We've got something that works for that particular stage, but you know, how are we going to make this work going forward as well? How are we going to try and make sure that we have keep this sustainable, keep this usable, and that you know, when the similar challenges come up, 
we get similar answers, similar fixes. So the idea is to have something that's reusable, have solutions that are reusable. You know, we see if you've got an organization, works on a product, works on multiple products, a lot of the problems, same problems are going to come up again and again and again. How do we authenticate users? How do we make sure that they are allowed to do what we want them to do? How do we make this content safe to render in a particular context or to use in a particular context? Um, how do we make sure that we're preserving state, that we're preserving a, an order of operations? Because if we have different solutions in different places, we end up with fragmentation. We end up with different solutions, different mechanisms, different configuration, and it gives us problems. Something means that we don't know how one's, something's considered in multiple places. Maybe we've got this sort of allow listing in one place, this sort of allow listing in another place. Um, maybe we're, you know, we're, we're, we're rendering things in different ways, in different uh, situations. Maybe we're using this HTML sanitizer in this application, this one in another application. Suddenly, keeping track of this becomes harder. Verifying that it's all working becomes harder. And if we need to make a change in the future, okay, we need to make this allow list stricter, we need to make this allow list weaker, so then we have to go to all sorts of different places to actually allow this to happen, to make this happen. So this is difficult. This is a lot of duplicated work. And I've seen organizations that work in silos. You know, this, organization, this product works this way, this other product works completely differently. They've independently had to come up with solutions on how to fix XSS, how to render HTML in a secure, secure way that takes out the, the uh, XSS. And you know, each organization has done it separately. Each, each product within the organization, sorry, has done it separately. They've all got separate solutions. So we want one way of doing this. We want a unified solution. Now, obviously, different languages are going to need different practical implementation, but the rules behind it, the configuration behind it, the, you know, the way that we're doing this, we want it to be the same. We want it to be centrally documented so that everyone can actually have one place and know, OK, in my organization, this is where I go to look for security information. This is where I go to find solutions to security problems. I'm not just thinking, well, you know, asking the person next to me at the desk, OK, what did you do last time we had to do this? But there is a known place where we go to and we find this information. We want a single source of truth. We want it to be a one-stop shop where I say, this is where I go for software security solutions. This is where I go to find out how do I fix this particular problem. And if we've followed this process so far, and we're using the ASPS for requirements, and we're using the ASPS to say, well, here's what we need to implement in this case. Here's what we need to consider in this case. Then that means that we can use the ASPS to document these solutions as well. We can incorporate these in the same place as well. So that, again, we're not looking for a what, and then we have to go and find the how somewhere else, or have to start Googling for the how, or start asking the person next to us, or finding someone in the organization who's done it before. But we've actually got the solution alongside the requirement we've been given in the first place. You know, we've taken a whole set of requirements. We've got the ones that are relevant for our future. We've got the ones that are prioritized. And now we've got, well, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to address this? So for example, if we've got this ASPS requirement that we need to handle around how we store passwords, it's all a bit complicated, it's a bit messy. Um, so, you know, some of you may be clear about this, some may not be. But why do we want our developers to get bogged down in that? Why do we want anyone to get bogged down in that? This is how we do it in Lumber. In Lumber, we have a password storage library. It uses this, this function to store passwords, it uses this function to verify passwords, job done. The developer's got a requirement. They don't need to worry about how to implement that. That is just centrally documented. And again, this needs to be something that's handled for different languages. There is a challenge there. But the idea is you want one solution for doing it and one way of doing it within the organization. Similarly with uh, encoding, or output encoding. Again, there are specific requirements for different situations. Is it going into JavaScript? Is it going into an HTTP header? Is it going into an HTTP, um, HTML entity? Is it going into an attribute? The rules are different each time. You have to think about what's relevant to my situation. Well, first of all, maybe we're mandating that we use a particular front-end framework, and then you use that framework, use the default functionality, and it worries about it for you. Maybe it says you need to contact the security team if you're doing things in an unusual way. But the how is already there. We don't have a developer sitting thinking, OK, after all this, I've still got these requirements I need to think about. Now what am I going to do? But the solution is right there waiting for them. And it's clear, OK, this is how we do this here. Another example, um, HT, uh, HTTP headers. Common thing, sort of thing that scanners love, pen testers love, adding is like low risk, medium risk, or high risk if they're not good pen testers. Um, again, these are sort of problems that each 
web application that's developed in the organization is going to have. We don't want each developer to think, well, how am I going to do this in this case? Maybe we have a centralized way of addressing it. Maybe each application uses a particular reverse proxy, and that's going to add those headers for them. They know that they need to consider these requirements, and here's the solution. Here's what they need to do. The idea is that we don't just want to bring problems. We want to bring solutions as well. We don't want to bring, here's what to do. We want to bring how to do it. And we want to keep that centralized to make sure that they know where to look. They're not just having to rely on their own internal you know, team knowledge bases, product knowledge bases. But this is something that is done across the organization. We know that in general, I don't know, you can come up to me and tell me you disagree afterwards, but for the most part, developers significantly outnumber people with this specific security knowledge. And we need to find ways of making that scale. Having that sort of centralized repository and having this one place, one single source of truth is going to make that a little bit easier. So, yeah, we want to make this reusable. We want to make it sustainable. We want to have a centralized mechanism. We want to think about how, you know, for each language, maybe the implementation is different, but the configuration is the same. The rules are the same. If we need to make a change, we're making a change to one set of rules. And we can use that along with our use of the ASPS to say, here's the what, now here's how you do that. So that's the final summary. These are the ideas, the solutions we talked about today. We want to customize the ASVS. We want to take the ASVS and say, well, what's right for organization? What's right for this particular feature? How are we going to make it easier to break this down for a particular feature? We're going to contextualize security. We're going to say, look, security is not special. When you think about security alongside everything else in, your, in the application, all the other considerations in the application, but what does security mean for us? What's important for us? What is going to make our business sad and tailor our, um, ourselves towards that and be ready to focus on that because then we have to prioritize and we have to say well what are these requirements that are relevant are most important for us what do we want to focus on where do we want to start what order do we want to address things in and also consider the other trade-offs around you know having quick wins but impactful fixes as well balancing off maintaining velocity whilst also you know improving security but making sure that we're tracking what we're delaying saying okay we're not doing this today we're doing it tomorrow but we're not losing sight of it, we're keeping track of it, we're monitoring it on an ongoing basis. And finally, having it reusable, having solutions alongside the requirements, having a centralized way of saying, this is how we do this here, this is a mechanism we use for this. You don't need to go and figure it out, you don't need to start from scratch, you don't need to start from a blank page and say, well, now, how do I encode HTML? How do I encode uh, something that I'm rendering in, into HTML? How do I securely work with this database? How do I add HTTP headers? The solutions are there, they're centralized, and they're lower friction to get to. So I hope that's been a useful overview, useful ideas. The SVS is a big, big document. It's hard to use. There's a lot going on there. We want to make it more usable. We're hoping for a, a version 5 in the near future, which will be more usable, easier to understand, but it's still going to be a lot. We need to take that big um, you know, security big picture and it down to focus on what's important at our point in time and that way we're sort of spreading ourselves left we're encouraging developers to think about security and to build security in but we're also making it bite-sized and manageable and hoping to cre create less friction um, yeah so tailor the SBS think about security as a characteristic tailor yourselves to your biggest threats prioritize and then you know, document your solutions um, yeah, I hope that's been useful to you, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is it possible to or do you map the ASPS towards like risk control points or the ISO? So the question is, is it possible to map it to other standards such as NIST or ISO? It's certainly possible. Um, mappings is a tricky topic because from, more from a, a maintainer point of view. It's, uh, mappings are difficult to maintain. When things move around, we have to worry about the mappings as well. So it's possible, but it's not something we work on as like a core focus. The, um, you know, if we have a mapping to CWE and that gives us some value, it also gives us some difficulties. We're certainly open to mappings and it's certainly something that can be done, but there's nothing necessarily out of the box or that's officially maintained for it. Um, what I will mention 
when we talk about mappings, is there is another project called the OWASP Integration Standards Project, which I think it's also called OpenCRE. Um, but yeah, OWASP Integration Standards is probably easier to Google for. Um, and they are a project that are trying to link between the different OWASP projects. So, okay, here is a requirement in SVS, and here is it how it maps to the OWASP uh, web security testing guide of how to test for this particular issue, or here's the item in the OWASP top 10 that it's most relevant to, or the item in the proactive controls that it's most relevant to. So that may help, although again, that's within OWASP primarily. Any questions? Okay. You showed the first question there on your slide. Who answered that question? Was it the security team or the developer? Um, Got it. So the ideal should be that developers should be able to answer those questions. So the, the question was who answers the questions at the beginning, the questions that then lead to which requirements are relevant for particular features. So you select particular questions from that sheet and it then populates a series of requirements that are relevant. So the idea is that those questions should be clear enough that developers can answer them. They should be functionality focused. They should be, you know, they, again, there will be some terms in there that may need to be clarified or explained, so, you know, authorization, what do I mean when I say authorization? But in general, the focus should be on developers. Developers should be able to fill that out and therefore get the requirements that are relevant to them. I think security, you're gonna to have to work with them to begin with to actually build up the questions and build up the mappings of requirements, but you want the developers to be able to do that on an ongoing basis. Okay. Go on. Any news on when version five will be released? <laughs> Any news on when version five will be released? Um, we are working on it. It is a big standard. There's a lot of work to do. Um, we are you know, working as volunteers on this, obviously. I mean, OWASP is a volunteer-led project. And the moment, OWASP is looking at ways that it can use funding to accelerate certain projects. Because you know, I know that I spent several hundred hours on this in the last year. I know that other leaders spent several hundred hours on this. And you know, it's, a it's a big time investment. And, we are making some progress and we are pushing towards it. We don't have a firm timeline at the moment. We are going to see whether some of the big organizations that are starting to use it more are willing to put some funding behind it so that we can accelerate that and say, okay, well, I'm gonna spend a week just focusing on this because I've got some funding to do that. So we don't have a hard timeline at the moment. Um, we're hoping it will be this year, but it's a bit, it's time dependent. I have to, you know, I'm very lucky that my day job at, at Bounce Security lets me work on it quite a lot on bounce security time as well. Um, and you know, other leaders also, their employers let them work on it on their time, but it's not, for a project of this size and complexity, it's not enough. I and mean, we have a backlog of about 100 issues in GitHub, each of them asking sort of subtle questions about each requirement, and it's a lot of work, unfortunately. Go. Um, how can you stop the well, developer to be kind of overwhelmed with the ASVS and threat models? So you have to do both before you start working on security. Mm -hmm. uh, if you introduce too much, they won't really stick with it. So how can you kind of help uh, the developer to include this in their development process? So how can you help the developer include it, keep them from being overwhelmed? You know, I think this is part of the idea of you know, the, the, uh, the customization and the prioritization. We're going to say, well, you're not looking at, looking at 280 things. You're looking, you know, the developer's not, you know, ultimately the idea is developers answering questions and gets a bunch of requirements. And it should be a lot less requirements than there are on the SVS. It should be a lot more focused. And the threat modeling side of it and mapping to particular threats, you have to decide what's best if the developers can interpret that, if security needs to be involved in that stage. But the idea is that it's a significantly compressed form, they're looking at a much smaller set of things, and they're looking at a more simplified view. You know, the threat model isn't, gonna, you're not gonna bring them a threat model that's got, you know, here's a hundred things that our organization is worried about. No, you know, here are the key things, and you can have that in mind whilst you're trying to prioritize these 10 or 15 security requirements you've received. So, you know, the idea is to try and cut it down as much as possible, focus on what's important, and you know, provide that higher level view. Okay, more questions? Okay, well look, I'm gonna be around for the rest of the day. So yeah, thanks very much for the, uh, going for the early slot and I'll see you later on. <laughs>